Welcome to the Healthy Screen Habits Podcast. We are the first generation to parent while balancing screens, life, and family. Each episode features insights, tips, and takeaways to help establish safe, mindful habits while living your family's healthiest digital life. I'm your host, Hillary Wilkinson. Now, whether you're starting your parenting journey with a newborn or looking to connect with your teen on technology, this is the podcast for you. It's rare you get the opportunity to speak with one of the greatest thinkers of our time. Today, I get the privilege of doing just that. Dr. Temple Grandin is a professor of animal science at Colorado State University. Facilities she has designed for handling livestock are used worldwide. Her research and techniques have been instrumental in implementing animal welfare auditing programs used by McDonald's, Whole Foods, and other corporations. Now she has done this all by embracing her autism, channeling her unique gifts as a scientist and animal animal advocate, and now is encouraging kids to put down devices and get outside. I could not be more honored to welcome to the Healthy Screen Habits podcast, Temple Grandin. It's really good to be here today. Thank you. You have just published a truly delightful book. Thank you for sending me a copy of The Outdoor Scientist. Why did you decide to write this book now? Well, I live in a neighborhood, lots of kids in it. I've lived in this neighborhood for 31 years, and you almost never see kids outside. They're just not doing the things outside that I did in the 50s as a child. I mean, mother would say, you know, go outside and play. And my sister and I had a rock collection. We'd break rocks open to see what they looked like inside. I emphasize, got to wear safety goggles for doing that. And we had a really great rock collection in the uh, tool shed. We'd collect shells on the beach and make stuff out of them. Um, I can remember uh, like taking a, a buds apart to figure out how they developed. Even, um, even at a young age, you were a scientist in observing nature already. Well, I was like eight when I was doing a lot of these things. And I have another book that came out three years ago, Calling All Minds. And that's outdoor stuff, but it's more... It's all more stuff where you make things like kites, parachutes, airplanes, things like that. Because we've got kids today, when I did a book signing for Calling All Minds three years ago, a good 20 or 30% of kids in Colorado had never made a paper airplane. Wow. I am not kidding. And I had a student in my class, in my class of my livestock handling class, the students have to do a scale drawing of a cattle handling facility. I had a student who had never used a ruler in her life to measure anything. What are they doing instead? What, in, your, in your experience with these, with the, because your work with college age kids. This is college kids, never right. used a ruler. And I've been having a scale drawing in my class. I've had, I've taught that class for 31 years. In the last five or six years, they're having a harder and harder time with doing a scale drawing. And it gets back to where we've got kids uh, growing up today, they don't do anything, any practical things anymore. I've heard firefighters say the same thing about kids coming into the firefighting academy who don't know the difference between, say, a Phillips head and a flathead screwdriver. Right. No, we've got kids coming in, kids today that have never used a tool. I think that's just terrible. And when I did the Calling All Minds book, one of the projects is in there. There's a project I did in about the second grade. I can still remember my little kid's hands weren't very strong. And I took both hands to cut a coat hanger because I wanted to make a crossbar to put on my parachute strings that I made made a parachute with a scarf. Um, you know, we grew up using tools. Every kid in the neighborhood was doing that. And I think the other problem we've got today is kids are terrified of making a mistake. And I think this goes back to not doing any hands-on things because I had these little kites I made that I had to tinker and tinker and tinker with to get them to work. Uh huh. And I had, I had to do quite a few pieces of paper before I got them to work. People ask me, what would I do if I could improve education? The first thing I would do is um, putting a lot of these hands-on things back in, cooking, sewing, woodworking. And we're getting individuals today totally removed from the world of practical 
things. Right. I know in Calling All Minds, you talk about the difference between clever engineers and mathematical thinkers. Right. And you, I, I love the parallel you draw between clever engineers and common sense and the importance of giving kids experience to make things with their hands and bringing it back to healthy screen habits. That's part of the challenge of our digital age is this is what devices are keeping kids from doing is they're providing experiences, but they're not providing physical hands-on experiences. Well, I think we need to be using the screens. Okay. Like, um, I, kids that had never made a paper airplane. And there's lots of stuff on YouTube about making paper airplanes or making paper snowflakes. I was horrified within the last year when I talked about a kid making a paper snowflake. And I had a teacher ask me in all seriousness, what do you think is going to happen to the kid's self-esteem if the snowflake fell apart? Because he cut it out wrong. I said, well, you make another one. And right. then maybe you look it up on YouTube. Okay, that's going to be using a screen to find out how to do a physical thing. It's, you know, we don't build confidence by just continually boosting people up. You build no, you confidence. Don't. You build confidence through overcoming challenge. And whether you're being challenged through editing a paper or like you said, like building a kite that doesn't fly and then, you know, working on that confidence then building then then builds competence so they work hand in hand that whole confidence right. and competence but i've had so many parents say to me my kids afraid to make a mistake my kids everything's got to be perfect you know that you, you've got to do good work but sometimes you do make mistakes i remember wrecking a sewing project when i was about 12 i got an aria and i cut the fabric wrong and it wrecked i had to throw uh -huh. it away there was no way to buy more fabric because it was a remnant yeah. Yeah. But I think it's important that we provide lots of those experiences for our kids to find out that the world's not going to end because you have to throw away the sewing project. No, it did not end. Yes. <laughs> and look at you now. <laughs> I, I think this goes to that point of what we say at Healthy Screen Habits is we are not anti-technology. No. We are tech intentional using technology as a tool that it was intended for and then moving forward with whatever project you're working on. Well, that's the way I would look at it. I had a problem where my toilet broke and I looked it up and I found a YouTube video that showed me how to fix it. I know that we call it YouTube University. So when we come back, we're going to speak more with Temple Grandin regarding what what being on devices too long have to do with productivity. Do you know what's happening during your child's online exchanges? As well-intentioned as we are, often reading every text message, post, and email is just not realistic. This is where Bark comes in to help. Founded in 2015, Bark Technologies provides a parental control app that monitors and alerts parents to online threats. Bark was created for parents by parents to offer a better, easier, and more effective way to keep children safe online. Bark monitors posts and messaging for things like signs of bullying and communication with dangerous strangers. Bark's algorithms analyze all activity and issue parents notifications via their chosen communication method. Gain peace of mind and get 10% off of Bark service for life by using the Healthy Screen Habits link. Go to our website at healthyscreenhabits.org, click on the Tools button in the drop-down menu, and look for products we endorse to find Bark. It will be the easiest click you make all day. Peace of mind is just a bark away. I'm back with Temple Grandin, who has recognized that autism gives her a unique lens on the world. You have spent the better part of your adult life translating animal behaviors and now exploring and explaining why all kids need to be using their hands, exploring outside, and really importantly, given license to fail. 
Temple, you encourage kids to use technology for the knowledge-seeking tool it was intended to be, and then use that to apply knowledge in the physical world. But I've also hear, heard you warn against spending too much time online. Well, what I'm saying is, um, well, especially with autistic kids, and when I, I spent 25 years working out heavy construction on supervising steel and concrete, cattle stockyards and other things that I had designed, I worked with welders and machinery designers that owned their own businesses that I know were autistic. They were just as autistic as they could be. And these are people I worked with in the 80s and the early 90s. And they were visual thinkers like me, thinking pictures. And what little video game playing I've done, I'm going, this is like a drug. I've got to stay away from this. And now, I, what I've seen with some of these kids now with an autism label is that, well, go out and get a job and do things. That's a good thing. Or end up just playing video games all day and doing nothing else. Uh huh. And I've read the scientific literature and there's a tendency for them to get more addicted to it than quite a few other people. So that right. has to be limited. And they're not becoming video game designers. If they were getting great jobs in video game design, I would not be criticizing it. Right. So what would you say to parents of neurodiverse kids who ask, like, why do I have to take my kid off of their device? It seems like it's the only thing that makes them happy or it's the only thing that makes that, that they like to do. Well, they haven't discovered other things to do. I think this and I'm, I'm not saying I wouldn't ban video games, but it's an hour a day or you give them a certain budget of time a week. When I was a child, I mean, TV was a new thing when I was a child. We were limited to one hour a day during the week and two hours on the weekend. Well, I think now with these online uh, things that where kids talk to each other, um, I know that's how some individuals get their best social life. You can say, well, you have a budget for the whole week. If you want to spend it on one marathon on Thursday for some big video game tournament, you can do it. But then the rest of the time you can't play it. But I have seen in the last couple of years, three successful young adults getting off of video games. And the thing that the video game was replaced with was car mechanics, three different separate cases. And car the kid mechanics. found that car mechanics was more interesting than video games. One mom happily told me that her autistic kid now fixes trains for the railroad and they love him. But you know, the visual thinkers like me uh, tend to like, we like mechanical things, art, photography, graphic design that was the thing that successfully got them off of it and i think adults. i think that speaks to your impassioned cry towards all parents to get kids outside and experiencing real life well things. this is the reason why i did the outdoor scientist is is and a lot of the things that are in there things i, I did as a child the rocks the shells uh the you know, taking plants apart, you know, different stages of development. I did that. I can remember when I was a child uh, trying to watch Sputnik. We went to the field next door and all we saw was airplanes. But there is a chapter in On the Night Sky where you can um, look at a NASA website to find a space station. Oh, and I loved how you did the constellation map in the flashlight. There's one of the activities where you poke holes in paper and put it over the end of a flashlight. And well, that's can... basically what a planetarium does, but in a much more complicated manner. Right, but you could do it in your own bedroom. Well, that's right. And, and I wanted to have simple things in both of these books, simple stuff that kids could do that's not expensive, that they could do. And now one thing that, uh, that I have in the Outdoor Scientist is a college project for kids to do, an actual college project I did for an animal behavior class. And what the assignment was is to spend four hours watching an animal. And I, you know, my teacher says, no, you're not doing cattle. You're going to find something else to do. You're not doing dogs. They wanted us to kind of walk. Branch out. <laughs> and and I, I went to the zoo and there were antelopes in this great big pen in Phoenix, Arizona. And I watched the antelopes. And after watching for a few hours, I found two males in adjacent pens went and put their locked horns through a chain link fence. They were going to duke it out with a chain link fence between them. And it was just something that only lasted for about 30 seconds. But if I, but I had to sit there two hours to see that. The rest of the behavior was pretty boring, walking around, eating, things like that. And that's the reason why the professor assigned it for four hours. So um, they could do an ethogram. You know, I've had, 
I had a reporter say to me, well, what about kids in the city? There's nothing to observe for animals. I go, there's pigeons. You could go pick out a pigeon that's very distinctive, that's probably comes back, and you can start tracking what it does. That's an animal ethogram. Right, or even yeah, insects. Uh, yeah, I love uh, how in the uh, the outdoor scientists, the projects and activities, like you said, the the projects are fabulous. The materials are easy to come by. Most can be found outside, or you already have the materials at home and the projects range from artwork to experiments and one of the other things that i really love about the book is that you spend a lot of time covering other scientists yes. and a lot of women scientists women in history and i think you did a beautiful job of just covering all of that as well as giving us a peek into your world growing up, which was a different time. And so that lends its own interest to it. And then your experiences as a child with autism. But a lot of the experiences that, you know, things that we did in this book, I mean, the other regular kids were doing it too. All this playing outside. Okay. One of the things is making a tent by putting a sheet over a rope. Um, well, we, we did, we actually, we actually sewed some tents that were more elaborate than that out of multiple ripped up old bed sheets. Um, but that's, and, and the, all the neighborhood kids were involved in this. This is just the kind of stuff that we would do when it was like, go outside and figure out stuff to do, make a tent out of old bed sheets. Going back to the technology side of things, it's not that you're against technology. It's just the amount of time that is being spent on a device, on a video game, when a kid could be doing something that's exposing them to other things, correct? Well, that's right. And you can use, um, you know, even the thing like the paper snowflake will go, you know, I'm sure there's YouTube videos about that. There's all kinds of stuff available online making paper airplanes. But the thing that shocked me was one out of four, or maybe one out of three, it was somewhere in between their elementary school children out in a nice part of a city outside of Denver, never made a paper airplane. I was shocked. And they got their chance to make a paper airplane for the first time at this big theater, and they were chucking them off the balcony. And they discovered it was a lot of fun. And I'm concerned about losing skills. There's a tendency to sort of uh, not give enough credit to craftsmanship skills. Right. You shared your interest in flight and space travel, even starting with trying to view Sputnik from a field when you were younger. As we're recording today, a historical event took place earlier this week in space travel with the landing of the Mars rover, the Perseverance. Have you been following that? I was online last night. Okay, now this is using a screen. And Perseverance is taking really interesting selfie with the, her robotic arm up on Mars. And she's showing off her beautiful handcrafted cables, cable bundles. Somebody built that by hand. I had already looked up the camera company. I already found the cameras. There's hand-done wiring on those cameras. A lot of this stuff was built in a shop. You're not talking about something that's mass produced in the factory. You've got craftspeople made this thing. So they're not getting enough credit. And I remember speaking with you earlier, you had told me about working on a meat packaging plant where all of the machinery had to be brought in from Europe. Oh, poultry now? Oh, it was uh, poultry. It, it wasn't. Was a poultry processing plant, state of the art. It's about two years old now. And all of the engineering, I call the clever engineering equipment, clever, mechanically clever devices are from Europe. Now, the other thing is interesting is when the patent office first started, it was all the visual thinkers. You had to bring models in. It was all what I'm going to call clever engineering. And we're not making this stuff anymore. And I think this goes back to Holland and other Europe, Germany, those countries, they, they you know, skilled trades are not looked down upon. And, right. and, and kids they're respected are... a whole lot more and they're making this stuff and it costs astronomical sums of money to bring poultry processing equipment over here in a hundred shipping containers. Astronomical. Yes. 
Yes. Not to mention the effect that, you know, the carbon footprint on that just, I know you, you've explained how the way you think you see things in pictures and you do not believe that the algebra that's being pushed, it's, it's almost screening potential clever engineers out of the engineering field. There's two kinds of kind of thinking that go into designing and engineering. First of all, you have an engineering department in the university. You'll have an industrial design department. That's more my department. But I'm what's called an object visualizer. That's a scientific name to me, an object visualizer. The mathematical kind of person is the visual spatial person. And unfortunately, there's a lot of studies that mix those two together, and that's wrong. Um, But the visual spatial is the more mathematics. And when I did my book, The Autistic Brain, I provided science for that and there's now been more studies that show that this is true and you get somebody that's got a label they tend to be more extreme maybe mathematical or more extreme maybe object visualizing but my kind of mind absolutely can't do algebra i can do my old-fashioned fifth and sixth grade arithmetic the way it used to be taught like find the area of a circle i know how to do that um i can you know find how much figure out how much carpet you need to do to you know carpet a room I measure things. That's stuff that I know how to do. But I'm concerned that we're screening out these kids. The other thing that's screening them out is they're growing up and not getting a chance to use tools. They're not growing up and getting enough chance to do hands-on things. Now, when you spoke about earlier, you talked about um, when you were when you first saw video games and you were looking at video games as that visual based thinker you said oh i can't do this because you recognized that i already i played them some okay okay played them some and i thought i'd been on it for 20 minutes i'd been on it for four hours yeah it's that persuasive design use my computer all the time to look up scientific articles look things up online do conferences like this Uh Uh-huh. You just recognize that the games are something that are not for you. I better stay away from them. Now, there's lots of people that play them perfectly fine, and they're not addicted to them. And there's some um, kids with autism where the only place they have friends is with online games where they talk to each other. So you don't want to take that away. But you've got to limit it somewhat because I'm not seeing good outcomes. The outcome is not top video game design. That's right. usually, it doesn't seem to go that way. Maybe may some exceptions to that. And that's just great. But right. you probably had some parents behind that that were directing them more towards, well, you got to design video game that somebody else wants. Right. And unless you have kind of parents that are maybe involved in Silicon Valley or maybe involved in that area and they know how to channel those efforts, that, that isn't necessarily well, something that's There was an that's article gonna... in the paper a while back where Silicon Valley parents were restricting all the video game playing. They yes. were restricting that. Yes. Because they know how addictive it is. And yes. they, a lot of them send their kids to Montessori schools, which would have a lot of hands on mm-hmm. activities. Exactly. Exactly. They've got a lot of hands on activities, a lot of immersive experiences, and sensory things that. That's right that happen. I think the challenge also when we get into the digital platforms, particularly with our neurodiverse kids, is it locks them in to one way of experiencing. And it we need to be working on expanding. Can you talk a little bit about how your mom encouraged you to stretch? My well, mother had a really good sense that um, couldn't shouldn't just be doing the same thing over and over again. Because when I was in about third grade, I'd just draw the same horse head over and over again. And my mother would um, say, well, let's draw the stable. Let's, you know, draw where we rode it to. In other words, make an associative link back and let's try some other media. Let's do a watercolor of a beach. Um, take that art ability and expand it so it's not just the same horse head over and over and over again. Expand that. That's what we need to be doing. Right. Whatever interest the child is showing, you take that and move forward with it. That's right. I agree. And you you expand it and encourage uh, lots of different things. But I've seen kids like 16 years old, they've they've done all the most complicated Legos and that's fine, but the kid has still never used a tool. It's just ridiculous. And we've got a gigantic shortage of skilled trades. And when I had to have my shower fixed, this was during COVID. Oh, the cost was just ridiculous. Because oh I couldn't spend a, a day and a half messing with it 
with two other apartments turned off. Right. So I had to call the plumber and I hate to tell you what it cost. Oh, I believe it. Okay. We often talk about keeping spaces screen free where we don't allow devices. What do you think about that? Well, I really agree with that. And in the fifties when I was brought up, that was true in our dining room and in uh, the next door neighbor kids too, that when we all had dinner together, we weren't allowed to bring books, toys, or comics or anything like that to the dinner table. This was the time for the family to be together and talk and talk about their day and take turns talking. I do think that that is one of the interesting things that during our time of quarantine that it has brought us is I do see more families engaging in more connected things. I think because people are kind of technologically saturated, if you will, where they've spent their whole day on Zoom or... That's eight. right. And so I do see more families outside taking walks or going yes. on bike rides. I'm seeing that too. Yeah. I have seen that too, whole families out on bikes. On, and then I heard that the online um, jigsaw puzzle sold out just about instantly. Oh, yes. We always have a jigsaw puzzle going. We're going to take a quick ad break. And we come back, we're going to be listening to Temple Grandin give us one healthy screen habit. Are you looking to get your child a phone but don't know where to start? With after school practices, meetings and hangouts, do you want to have the ease of texting but not the worries that come with internet? Good news. Healthy Screen Habits has done the legwork for you. We can take away the guesswork of what's best, and our answer is Gab Wireless. Gab Wireless created the phone that parents have all been asking for. It can text, but doesn't receive or send pictures. It looks like a smartphone with a touchscreen, has talk, text, calculator, calendar, FM radio, and alarm functions, but no internet. Setup is super easy. Plug it in and start charging. Activation is free, shipping is free, and the best news is that Gab Wireless phones start at under $100. Fun fact, the average teen Gab Wireless user spends 80% less time on their phone than the average team. That's time that can be spent mastering a musical instrument, helping life skills, and may learning to communicate face-to-face -face with empathy and connection. Or maybe it's just time to finish chores and take out the trash. It doesn't matter. At any rate, it's 80% less time that you'll be telling your kids to put your phone down. You're welcome. Now, even more good news. You can get $5 off your order of a Gab wireless phone by using the promo code HSHABITS. That's HS Habits, like healthy screen habits, but shorter. You can find a link to Gab Wireless under the Tools tab on our website at www.healthyscreenhabits.org. Press and hold the Tab menu and look under Products We Endorse in the drop-down menu. You're looking for Gab Wireless. G -A -B be wireless. Your child's first phone that's smart for them. I'm talking with Temple Grandin, a woman voted by Time Magazine as one of the 100 most influential people in the world. She is on a mission to get kids exploring and outside. So, Temple, on every episode of the Healthy Screen Habits podcast, I ask for one healthy screen habit that our listeners can put into practice in their own home. Do you have one? Oh, I definitely do, because there's all kinds of great resources on the internet. In my book, um, The Outdoor Scientist, um, I refer to the NASA website, I refer to National Geographic on the citizen science. Um, there's great websites on mathematics, Wolf from Mathematica, Wolf like the animal, Ram also like the animal, code.org to teach programming, fabulous um, educational resources. A lot of this stuff is free and, and use these things to complement things that you do outside. Okay, let's say you're watching birds. Well, you can look them up online. You can go on things like Google Scholar and look up, that's maybe for older kids, but uh, scientific articles about it. Uh, all kinds of videos on YouTube that show you how to do things. It Use it to complement rather than just totally take over. I, I love that. Use it as the tool it was designed for, as a complementary 
type thing to an activity outside. And for any of our listeners who want to go out and buy their own copy of The Outdoor Scientist, I will link it in our show notes. But most importantly, I'd say take those kids and get outside. Thank you, Temple. It's been a true honor to speak with you today. It was wonderful to be here, and thank you for having me. For more information, you can find us on Instagram and Facebook at Healthy Screen Habits. Make sure to visit our website, healthyscreenhabits.org, where you can subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts or via RSS, so you'll never miss an episode. It's free, it's fun, and you get a healthy new screen habit each week. While you're at it, if you found value in this show, we'd appreciate you giving us a quick rating. It really does help other people find us and spread the word of healthy screen habits. Or if you'd simply like to tell a friend, we'd love that too. I so appreciate you spending your time with me this week, and I look forward to learning more healthy habits together.